I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. So people are a little more civil now. The country's a little more tolerant than it was. It's a little more inclusive than it was. That's the change, okay? We no longer have segregation, Jim Crow, legalized. I can go back to my birth home now and ride and sit on the bus anywhere I want to. You know, I can sit down at a restaurant and have a cup of coffee, but it's never been about hamburgers. <laughs> <laughs> it's never been about a cup of coffee. It's about an unshared power relationship. Nothing else. Nothing else. <laughs> power needs to be shared. Some people have too much. Others have too little. Slaves have too little. Jefferson doesn't have too much. <laughs> and since I create that wealth, I deserve some of it. That's what I think. You know, that, what I just said would drive 90% of American people mad, including some black people, because somehow the truth got lost under all this race, black, white, foolishness. Let me tell you what I think about race. I think it's the greatest myth ever perpetrated on the human mind. This modern thing you call race, which people didn't belong to before. There had always been peoplehood, you know, people, consciousness of kind. I'm going to be like people who are more like you was but what it wasn't because of your color. It was because of your culture. It was because the real meaning of being human is inside of people. The issues of civil rights were moral issues, justice, fairness, equality. And what I'm observing is that it's anything but that. That we have I believe, lost the moral compass of the civil rights movement. And what we're finding is that children are having to learn all over again that education has great value uh, for them and was a historical valuable point for their ancestors and parents. Mm -hmm. They're having to learn that um, that justice isn't always blind and that they are um, products or they're having to relive a society that still hasn't lost the determination to make them second-class citizens. So the 20-plus years and all of the messages and conversations that we've had as a people, as a society. We're having to relive them, recast them, rediscuss them. And I think that's a great disappointment for me. I had hoped that our children would not have to go through some of the things they're having to go through. I had hoped that our struggle as a people, our willing to suffer, our willing to sacrifice, our willing to speak to people, to give them history, to inform them about our history as a people, that that would hold for a while, that it would last for several generations so that we could change the climate. But I'm discovering that 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 core of denial and the core of real racism, and as ugly as that word is, we have to use it because racism means, when you use that, you mean power and authority to deny rights. Those are racists. 
people who have the power and the authority to deny you your rights. So it still exists. And I'm disappointed in that. Well, I think the biggest difference is in the, in the 60s, the, the, the frontier for change were, were things that needed to be legislated. They were identifiable and they were specific having to do with education, having to do with voting, having to do with jobs and inclusiveness. Um, fast forwarding to the 2000s and even the late 90s, um, <clears throat> freedom issues are, are, are internal. Um, they have to do with uh, being healthy, being informed, being educated, um, um, and, um, and, and being free. I think the good things that have happened is um, opportunity, opportunity for women, for people of color, for um, the possibility for young people. But I guess my downside to that would be forgetting that we're all in this together and the individualistic approach to institutions, family, community, and things of that nature. In the last 20 years, I think the changes we've seen, at least in my opinion, have been better economic opportunities for communities of color with regard to having a chance to have a little bit more upward mobility, um, being able to um, make a difference in their own communities economically, which has really been kind of bedrock of helping uh, communities of color move to another level of excellence, if you will, and uh, being able also to um, better themselves in a situation where they can also improve their condition and quality of life for their family members as well. Um, so that the economic piece has been a real important piece that is, has been changing over the last 20 years. Um, better opportunities and access to education, which really is the key that kind of helps bridge the divide between those who have um, haves and haves not, so to speak. And I think that, uh, in my opinion, the more uh, students know about the opportunities that are available to them, uh, the better prepared they are to be the leaders of tomorrow. When I was a little girl, I really looked forward to the opportunity when I could drive. I was the youngest of six, and so I had to wait for five siblings to take me around. Sometimes I had to do it based on their schedules when they felt like it. So I was really, really pleased when I was able to finally drive. And I could make my decisions about where I wanted to go, when, and how. And then I also was really pleased when I had my own car and I could really decide when I wanted to use it. Well, one of the things that I was taught when I was uh, uh, growing up was that you share whatever you have. You know, we share candy, we share toys. So with my car, I felt like it was appropriate for me to share uh, rides with people. So if anybody needed a ride, I would give them a ride. But as I reflect back on that now, I realized that I would give them rides as long as it was not too inconvenient. If it was not too much out of the way, or if it didn't use too much of my gas, or if um, it wasn't going to require too much of my time. Well, I share this because when I reflect back on the civil rights laws and things that have passed, I think what we've done in terms of civil rights laws is similar to having a car and giving people, people rides. But when I look at and think about the laws, I think there were things built in that appeared to be sure that we didn't inconvenience the halves too much. And that as long as it wasn't too much out of the way or didn't take too much of the power, time, money, and resources. And I kind of want to reflect on a few examples of that to kind of help illustrate what I mean. You take, for example, uh, Emancipation Proclamation. I'm going to go way back 200 years, even though I know we're focusing on 20. You take Emancipation Proclamation. Well, that was a vehicle. We can look at that as a car. But I think we only took people a couple of blocks because along with the freedom that slaves then had, they weren't provided with other resources they needed, such as housing, food, um, and uh, jobs. So I, I kind of see that as similar to me. Yes, I gave somebody a ride. Yes, we gave them freedom, but it was only for so far. Another, when we think about separate but equal in terms of the schools and so forth, yes, you know, 
there were um, there was a law made that said we just want to make sure that no we don't have to really integrate the races but just just make sure it's equal well again we're in another car driving along how far did we go okay we uh, we have the right for education but inadequate facilities lack of training for teachers uh, overcrowded classrooms again the ride seems to be a brief ride. We don't seem to mind giving people a few blocks of a ride. Take the right to vote. Wow, that, that was really a privilege for women and African Americans. But then when we think about it, it was only specified for a certain time period. Recently, they had to extend that. Again, just a short ride. We don't want to be inconvenienced for giving up too many privileges, too many rights. Take... Uh, desegregated schools, integration. Great, this is the kind of progress and movement that we want and that we need. But again, how do we shorten that ride? We had attitudes to deal with, mobs. It was almost unsafe. We had to have police escorts. Oh, didn't quite give the, uh, the rides that we would, would hope. And I'll talk more about where we should be and could be heading with this. Take affirmative action. A lot of controversy about affirmative action. Uh, it's great that we saw that we needed to share uh, and give people the opportunity that they may not otherwise have. And even though people don't necessarily understand, you know, how is it fair and equal, you know, we can deliberate over that a while. I'm not going to spend time doing that now. But again, what shortened that ride are the glass ceilings. You know, there are statistics that show still the inequity in, in income of families, of uh, people of color versus white, um, inequities in terms of um, education, job opportunities, and positions, and so forth. Well, let's move and talk a little bit about aid to women and children in poverty. We know there was a great need for that, but, but how did we shorten that ride? What about health care? What about uh, child care, there are still many provisions that need to be made to help these people reach their full destination. What has changed is the country has been somewhat reformed by the civil rights movement, nothing else. I want to hear. <laughs> nothing else. It's a civil rights movement. It's black people suing in the courts until finally the court in 1954 decided that it was politically expedient to get rid of the, this, this unnecessary aspect of racism about you know the abuse and segregation and disrespect for black people, not because they suddenly saw black people as good human beings and so forth, but because of the communism, because of what was happening in the third world, because Africa and Asia were getting free. Now, how are you going to tell the world that you're a democratic country, that you're non-racist, and that you're all of these good things, and you've got a segment of people in your country that you are intentionally, consciously abusing by law? How are you going to tell a Nigerian who you want to sell refrigerators to? <laughs> that, you know, you like him when you don't like me, you know. It was just common sense. So I consider the Supreme Court decision a political decision. It's got nothing to do with anything else. <laughs> it's not moral, political. It made sense for them to do that at that time. Why not 1944? You know, in 1945, when a million black people, you know, who participated in that war again, <laughs> on various, as, you know, soldiers and laborers and so forth. So the, the point is that the Civil Rights Movement found the key to Pandora's box and opened it, and now we have all that we have in terms of movements. Oh, and where, do, where do I want us to go from here? Where I want us to go is reminding each other that, uh, that uh, hmm. I should say, believing in each other that we can do this together. That the disparities in all of the different areas for communities of color, our schools failing, um, all the hardships that so many of our individual families, our seniors, our disabled, I can go on and on, are having, 
that the only way I do believe that we can make a difference is if we work together. And so that's what I'm hoping we will do. But I do believe that won't happen unless we start getting informed and stop being tired and um, so busy with our own lives. I think the main and one of the most important things is the economic piece. Um, I really believe that if we um, get back to the economic piece and, and share the power is where I'm getting at. I think that sometimes folks feel like we made some we made some advances, and there have been some opportunities economically. You look at the athletes, you look at other folks who are in high profile positions. That's great, but as a country, we should be much farther than that, and we have to begin to look at really sharing the power on a level that allows us to move forward be beyond color and look at how can we make this country as a whole uh, much more prosperous for all of its citizens. Um, because as a country, we're one of the richest country, if not the richest country in the world. And so when you look at some of the problems with regard to the educational system, uh, some of our other issues, uh, we need to really kind of refocus our efforts and energies and channel our resources on bringing all of our, our citizens up. Well, it looks as if we're going to have to try courts again. We may have to start all over. It doesn't appear that we can... Well, let me think. Maybe... We used to say in the movement that you can change laws, but you can't change people's hearts. So maybe what we're realizing is that that is truer than we ever realized. That you can change laws, but you can't change people's hearts. Because unless they accept the moral authority that exists in all of us. We all have it. We just have to exercise it. And unless we, unless we reach the moral core, as Martin Luther King attempted to do, he tried to tell us that the struggle is a moral one. And I think we've lost that sense of morality. So where we go from here, it seems to me, is a need to try and re-teach society morality. And I'm not terribly optimistic because I think we have in our political system now um, people who don't seem to have, they speak of a moral center but they don't have it. So they use the words, which is always scary to me, because society is so seduced by words. And when, when leadership learns to use words that appear to address the moral issue, but then react and behave immorally, it's very hard for society to draw that line. They don't know it. They can't find it. We have, we've trained people to be 60 second sound bites. We've trained people to quickly uh, gather what's being said. We, we're not teaching people to be analytical any, well, I'm not sure we ever did, but we're surely not teaching analysis. We're not teaching um, the ability to transfer what one is saying about one's form of government to another form of government. So where I think we have to go is try again the critical thinking approach to try to help people think critically, to reintroduce morality as a God-given right, and to try to teach the larger system how to be honest and fair. But it has to do with black people's struggle. <laughs> this struggle impacts on everybody's life in this country. 
just like slavery impacted on everybody's life, whether you're in Georgia or New York, whether you're in Natchez, Mississippi, or Newport, Rhode Island, you were tied to slavery. <laughs> you know, slaves were under the gun, under the South, but the people in the North, the ones who made all the real money of the shipping industry, the torture-making instruments, God, all of the tertiary industries that were developed from slavery, you can't, I can't name them all, you know, and they weren't in the South. <laughs> The transportation system wasn't just, just in the South. The shipping industry was not controlled by the South. The rum was not a northern phenomenon, which are to its, 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 uh, its, its power, its, its wealth, and sugar. And so, yes, a lot of things have changed, and then again, nothing has changed. As long as white supremacy remains the mother tongue of this country, you can't change really race relations until you have some moral courage, a president or somebody or a great priest or somebody who can be listened to to take the risk to try to save the soul of this country and say, look, some mistakes have been made. Um, we, we have to recognize the, the genius, the humanity in every person. Genius is something that everyone has by virtue of existence. And it's there. We need to understand it. We need to recognize that, and 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 go from uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, exclusive elite mentality to an inclusive, cooperative mentality, and share. And 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 uh, there's a, there's a word that I like to to think of myself as, and I, and and it's an African word, and it's mbutu, and that means the ability to find the humanness in every person. The human and it's, no, it's the gift. Of being able to find the humanness in every person, and um, we now, because of the population explosion, we have to live closer to one another, and 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 because of the melting pot fiasco, which which didn't happen, you know, it served to dilute who we were rather than help us to promote who we were. We have to talk about living together in celebration of our differences as well as and, and our in celebration of our similarities as well you know uh, whereas um, some of the thinking is we had to live together in spite of our differences you know I think I think we need to celebrate our differences and 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 and, um, and live together because of them instead of just in spite of them. Um, those are those are starters and embrace one another because of our differences, you know. Oftentimes it seems as if it almost seems to require a law for people to do the kinds of things that we think are right and appropriate uh, when it comes to the lives of others. And then once those laws, take for example seat belts, you know, we're required to wear seat belts and people don't want to be inhibited, but then we have statistics that show it makes us safer, you know, we have child abuse laws that prevent us, we have alcohol laws. We find that all of these things do help and protect people, but it seems like the change in behavior, the change in attitude comes after those laws and requirements. It would be nice that if we, in the future, one day we could get to a point where we saw the importance and the need for making laws or, or for protecting the rights of people without having to be mandated by law. I believe my personal call is that as a first generation student myself, it's important I get back to the educational piece. And it's vital and very critical that we educate our community about those opportunities that exist for them. I've always said you don't know what you don't know, and that's very true in many situations with students is they don't understand um, how how much potential they have and the potential to earn a, a quality of life that would help them not only help themselves but help their families and their communities through educational opportunities. So I think my calling is to help expose students to the, the world of education and try to help them um, access those opportunities and reach their full potential through academic opportunities. As a child of God, 
my personal calling is to do the work that he put me here to do. And so that is using the different roles that I have to get people educated on their role in society. And especially as it relates to giving back and doing service and being informed and involved around policy. I'm, I've been called to a ministry. The, uh, yeah, I was just reading a, a, a quote today by an ancient Chinese guy, and his name was, uh, I can get it for you in a minute, but, but he, he, he says that the best leaders are the ones that people know the least about. And, and my calling is to, is to become the kind of elder that's going to leave this world a better place. I think that the World War II generation, the, the ones that preceded the baby boomers, I think they did a better job um, making us, the people, the recipients of the things they've never had. The education, when, when, when my generation uh, inherited America, we were the strongest generation in the history of mankind in terms of health, in terms of education, and economic wealth, generally speaking. We, as, 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 as stewards of this country, and of this globe need to turn over something better to the next generation. And, and, and my commitment to, to my highest power and, and to the generations behind me is, is to strive to leave something as conscientious as I would. I think my role is to help us remember from whence we've come as a people and as a society and I think it is to be available, to be available to my people and to the larger system, to try and share what I've learned. And, you know, we never seem to be given permission to retire. <laughs> and, I, and therefore, it, because we don't have the permission to do that, we have to just keep on, because the struggle doesn't end with retirement, with years. My parents struggled, and their parents struggled, and I'm struggling, my children are, my grandchildren, you know, my grandchildren see racism and unfairness all the time in their experience, which is very sad. So as an elder, my responsibility is to share, to try to tell what I've seen and what I know, and to be available to my people. And that's all I can do. I didn't really choose to do what I'm doing. I was chosen by the movement. That's, I mean, people are, you know, I'm not trying to be religious or anything, but it, this is what happened to me, and so many others. I'm an accidental academic. This is no design. What I teach and what I studied was not in, in academia. <laughs> and the people before me and before the people before me all were committed to understanding history in a different way. And exactly how it happened, I don't know. I don't have any epiphany where one day I said I was going to try to understand history and so forth. It was just there. And I've been dealing with this since I reach the age of reason, whatever that is, <laughs> you know, I mean, reading newspapers and so on when, when I was like eight, nine years old, even younger, I don't even know. And uh, gathering a lot of information, not knowledge, uh, about the other side, the flip side of American history, and that's about one of the flip sides. Another flip side is Native American history. You can flip that one too. But uh, so that's another story. <laughs> I'm talking a story that I know a little bit about. Uh, so, so um, uh, the fact that I have been around people now with hindsight, I can say it's exposed to people who, who committed their lives to social justice, uh, uh, to fighting for democracy and so forth. Obviously, I didn't know all of this when it was happening. You evolve into this and then the civil rights movement surfaced in the time and context when I was coming into some sort of uh, identity of my own and understanding values were crystallizing around what was happening. You know, what I'm a witness, you know, the Rosa Parks, and the sit-in movements, the wait-ins, the break-ins, God knows what end, and all of the 
civil rights activity and all of these brave, brave people who fought and died, the Fannie Lou Hamers and the, and the, and the Kwame Torres and the, some of many of these are still alive, and the Bob Moses and the Helen on the Holmes Norton and, and, and uh, um, um, uh, Joanne Robinson and, 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 and uh, the great E.D. Nixon who organized the Montgomery Boys boycott and pushed Martin Luther King in the front of it. Uh, ordinary everyday people. I, I'm not mentioning the leaders so much. Everybody knows everybody, you know, Malcolm and Martin and so forth, the triumph, and Medka, the triumphant. But I, this thing was driven by Martin calling them tramp, tramp, tramp and marching feet. Those are my heroes. I mean, I, there's no doubt about it, that that was very inspirational to me. You see these people who were seen at, at the very bottom of society being inspired to do something for themselves, and boy, they did do it. And all that genius came for them, the political leadership, the, the eloquence, the ability to organize themselves, you know, in Montgomery and in Mississippi and in Alabama, and then finally turn the Negroes in the North on to what really was happening. He thought he was free because he was riding in the front of the bus. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. And they said people can be duped, and they raised the question. And so I was trapped by that. And in fact, I would say I was doomed. I couldn't get out of it. I mean, I put aside everything, graduate school and so forth. That became insignificant to me. <laughs> Nothing was more important than the question of social justice. And so how I got here, I'm saying that I didn't decide one day like you decide you want to be a doctor, a lawyer, and so forth. That's not how it came about this. It's, it, I was chosen by impersonal, historical, social forces that I didn't even understand. But I knew it was right um, for me <laughs> to do what I right. So I haven't lost anything, I don't think. As we think about Martin Luther King, he was about helping others and not thinking so much of himself. And unfortunately, a cost that uh, was higher than any of us uh, are willing to pay. But I think as we reflect on the progress that's been made with civil rights in the past, as we look to the future, if we could just look at how, what can we do uh, to make sure that people can reach their destination uh, and not just giving enough to make do for the time being. Are we really solving any problems? Are we really making life any better? I think we just need to, to, to be quite frank and get back to the basis of what the dream was about, what its intent was for uh, us as individuals and us as a nation, and in a sense, do an assessment to see where we are. We, many of us, we have very different view, viewpoints about whether or not the dream is still alive. Um, and I think that if we begin to have some frank conversations, and not conversations just to have forums to talk about it, and, and, and sessions where you, you, you identify those issues. I would say you need to move a step farther and say, okay, what really is keeping us from resolving those issues? Again, you have to look at us as the most powerful country uh, economically in the world, and I think we have so many resources and opportunities that we need to bring to bear on this issue to move us forth in the 21st century. And so in order to do that, you have to have conversations that may not always be very comfortable conversations, but I think that when you get to the frankness of it and the truth of the matter, um, and people are genuine about those differences that they may have and the common areas that they have, uh, you can then begin to move forward if you begin to, if you have the, the courage to talk about the things that keep us apart. You know, we're getting into Martin Luther King time. And we get hung up on the dream, you know. And, and, and I believe that Martin Luther King never intended us to keep making his dream a dream. I believe that, that he's calling upon us now to wake up and, and to uh, achieve the, 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 the dictates that, that, that our, our forefathers paid lip service to in the first place, you know, where we'll be judged by the content of our, humanity, of, of our character and our humanity rather than superficial, self-servicing, special interest. I'm here because I'm here. And I'm here because I believe in the ideals of democracy. I do what I do because I, I think 
this country has possibilities. Uh, probabilities? <laughs> That's tougher to say. But possibilities, you know, you, you, might, you got a dream or you finish. You know, uh, like since this whole fast dreams where dreams die, life is like a broken winged word that cannot fly. So there's a dream in this land with its back against the world to save the dream for one. It must be saved for all. To save the dream for one. It must be saved for all. That's what I believe. I believe I want an open and free society. I want it to show that when I see you walking down the street, you really won't be a white person. You'll be a person, of course. <laughs> but your skin color won't mean any more than your hair. Or whatever, you know. I think that's possible. Not probable, but I'm saying it's probable. And you see me, you know, with my deeply hued melanin skin, and you just see some man, run, run, you know, this funny looking animal, uh, like we all are who stand erect, funny looking to the rest of the animal kingdom. I'm sure that if animals could talk, they, they, would, you know, they would just be laughing and talking. Look at that weird thing walking down the street. Look at him. Two legs standing straight up. That, and I have thought about that myself. I'm saying that's funny looking. When you think about it, <laughs> your people are funny looking because they walk erect, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> but if if we could come to that point, you know, it would mean any more than the color of your eyes, you know, skin, you know and, and so forth. Uh, that's what I want to see. Possible, but improbable, because <laughs> everything's possible. Everything that I can conceive of is possible in my mind. So that's where I'm at on that tip. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that, yeah, thing, every, the more things change, the more they remain the same. Everything's changed, yet yeah, nothing has changed. The more we've changed, we've changed fundamentally, relatively, but not fundamentally. Superficially, broadly, but not with any depth. The same questions that were here in 1787 are here no. I want you to first remember that um, 40 years after the dream, the dream is still being worked on and, and you're part of the work to get it done. That racism, classism, sexism is a part of our everyday life. That it's not um, an excuse that individuals have, it's a reality for so many. Um, and that you too have a responsibility in fighting all of the things that Dr. King and others fought so long and hard for and not to just get caught up in the memory of the day but trying to strive for the life that he, um, that he worked so hard for, for all of us. 